Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Hugh McKay, President of the Board of Directors of the City Club. Post 9-11, we find ourselves in a state of perpetual high alert, threatened by enemies we can't always easily identify or categorize. Yesterday's killing of Anwar al alakai was a major intelligence victory. The fact that he was a U.S. citizen who we had targeted underscores the complexities of national security and intelligence. Our national intelligence system has indeed grown enormously complex. It has been reported that 1,271 government organizations and 1,931 private companies in 10,000 locations work in counterterrorism and homeland security, and 854,000 people hold top secret clearances. The Washington Post recently wrote that, quote, the top secret world of government created in response to the terrorist attacks of September 11th, 2001, has become so large, so unwieldy, and so secretive that no one knows how much money it costs, how many people it employs, how many programs exist within it, or exactly how many agencies do the same work, unquote. Retired Army Lieutenant General John Vines, reviewing the tracking of sensitive intelligence programs, said, quote, the complexity of this system defies description. Because it lacks a synchronizing process, it inevitably results in message dissonance, reduced effectiveness, and waste. We consequently can't effectively assess whether it is making us more safe, unquote. So, today's speaker has his work cut out for him. In 2010, U.S. Representative Mike Rogers from Michigan's 8th District was appointed chairman of the House Intelligence Committee. His committee oversees the 17 agencies that make up the U.S. intelligence community, including operations and budgetary oversight, and it is the primary panel responsible for overseeing implementation of the intelligence community restructuring. Before his election to the House, Congressman Rogers served as a U.S. Army officer and commanding company commander, an FBI special agent, and as a member of the Michigan State Senate, where he served as majority floor leader. Prior to his chairmanship, Congressman Rogers authored the country's primary biodefense law to develop medical countermeasures for threats like anthrax, smallpox, chemical weapons. He helped formulate America's strategy for fighting al-Qaeda and the Taliban along the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. He issued an Intelligence Committee report on Iran's nuclear ambitions, and he wrote legislation to reauthorize and strengthen the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. He has also been an outspoken opponent of closing Guantanamo Bay. Congressman Rogers is well known for speaking his mind. He recently stated, we don't need to treat terrorists like U.S. citizens. We need to treat them like terrorists. Please welcome to the City Club the Honorable Mike Rogers. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Thank you very much. Gosh. Well, thank you very much, Hugh. I appreciate that uh, very kind introduction. And I uh, want to say thank you for getting lawyers back into the classroom. Uh, your work on the Bar Association to get lawyers teaching young kids the, the uh, importance of civics lessons, in, and apparently the grades have come up as well. Who would have thunk it? Lawyers in the classroom, huh? <laughs> That's a little counterintuitive at first, and then you kind of get into it. But you, I'm just kidding. Thank you very much. I also want to thank uh, Jim Thomas of uh, Squire Sanders for uh, arranging uh, my ability to be here today. Thank you, sir, for that. I appreciate the opportunity. To the City Club, thank you very, very much. I see on the wall some very distinguished... Uh, uh, speakers uh, have been here uh, before, uh, and I also have to thank you for uh, really lowering your standards. Not only a member of Congress, but a member of Congress from Michigan. <laughs> My gosh, you guys, thank you very much. It shows how egalitarian you really are. I, uh, I do appreciate that. I, I, I want to tell you that the role of intelligence in America, uh, I think, has never been more important and never been at the forefront of our national security like it is today. You know, and it started and it had noble beginnings, in, uh, certainly in our country. George Washington, who was frustrated by his lack of intelligence on British troop movements in and around New York, sent a very young and unfortunately inexperienced young spy to go find out what he could, Nathan Hale. Uh, and it wasn't long after his uh, tenure there that he was discovered as a spy for George Washington and was taken to be hanged. At that time, it was a hanging offense by the British. And he spoke those very famous words, I regret that I only have but one life to give for my country. He is 
famous in the halls of the CIA and other places where people who risk their lives every day all around the world to get the kinds of information we need to keep America safe, they know that, that, uh, that they're willing to make that ultimate sacrifice for us. And I can tell you, as someone who gets to spend time with our intelligence professionals all around the world, we should be awful proud of these young men and women who are willing to risk it all uh, to get the right piece of information to keep us safe. Really an amazing bunch of people. Somebody asked the other day, what does the intelligence chairman do, really? Uh, we have the 17 intelligence agencies. The unclassified number is about $80 billion that we spend every single year uh, trying to figure out what the bad guys are doing from all walks of international life. Uh, and it is a serious commitment on behalf of the United States. It certainly is a lot of money. Uh, our job is to look, and my job is to propose those budgets for that $80 billion to work with the administration and the other intelligence services to try to get the right number. We oversee on a daily basis uh, intelligence. I'm part of what's called the Gang of Four, so the very individuals who get the highest clearances the government can offer so that we can accurately process real-time intelligence, how it's working, uh, and any changes or, or uh, oversight matters that may come from that. So it is an incredible responsibility. I have now, we call it the secret squirrel room uh, in Washington, D.C. My, uh, my congressional staff hates it. Uh, I will disappear off the radar for long periods of time during the day uh, to go over real-time intelligence and, again, real-time authorization issues as it relates to national security. It's a big job. Uh, I think my FBI training, certainly my military training, have prepared me well uh, to serve in this capacity. And as I said, it gives me the unique opportunity to spend a lot of great and quality time with the men and women who are protecting this country in some really bad places. I, I apparently am not one of the smartest members of Congress. There was uh, someone going to uh, uh, a conference in Brussels, uh, was going through their processing, and I was going uh, to the tribal areas of Pakistan in the same line, and they were learning in which fork to use when they got there, and I was getting fitted for my bulletproof vest. So I thought, you know, maybe I have not got this congressional thing down exactly, <laughs> exactly right. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's been a real honor for that. And I have to tell you, uh, in the last 10 years since 9-11, we have broken down more barriers than you can possibly imagine. And we've infused technology with an increased, it's called human capability. That means people actually going out, talking to an individual and getting information from that individual uh, or recruiting them to spy for uh, or against whatever organization. For the United States, whatever organization, it could be a nation state, it could be a terrorist organization. We have infused uh, in a way and integrated in a way that I never thought possible when I was a young FBI agent working cases in the Chicago Organized Crime Bureau and I worked a few technology transfer cases back then. It was through Russia, Soviet Union. It's really quite an amazing thing. And what you saw and you're hearing today on the news with Anwar al-Awlaki uh, is months and years of preparation and integration with the smallest little tidbits of information fully integrated to bring justice to folks who are wishing to do harm. And no better, I think, example than that than the Osama bin Laden raid. We saw the very high profile portion of that raid uh, where the, the special forces, the good guys, go through the door and, and uh, bring uh, Mr. bin Laden to justice. But months and years of work and small pieces of information went together in order to make that raid possible. And it started with a little piece of information that was gleaned in an interrogation about that the possibility that someone had a cutout who was delivering information to Osama bin Laden years before the actual raid occurred. That's the only thing they had. And they had a nickname uh, on an Arabic surname uh, in a region, uh, they were saying, somewhere between Afghanistan, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, maybe even Somalia. Good luck. <laughs> and over time, they narrowed down little piece by little piece until they were able to discover, and why this was so tricky, I'll tell you, it was quite fascinating, is because they were very good at operational security. They would use a cutout for a cutout, and that means uh, in, in industry parlance that they would give somebody, they would say, Mike Rogers, I want you to go see Jim Thomas in this particular country, except that Jim Thomas wasn't his name. They'd give me a description of what he might be wearing and where he might be at a specific time. I'm supposed to deliver a certain good or message. That's it. 
Now, he didn't know who I was, and I didn't know who he was. Then his job was to do that same thing. And they would do it over and over again until finally that very trusted inner circle would get a hold of that piece of information and get it to Osama bin Laden. Now, you remember how hard it is. Even if you catch me, I can't even tell you who he is. If you catch him, he can't tell you who I am or who his contact is. It's a very good system, and it worked very well for them for a lot of years. And because of the professionalism and the integration of our intelligence services, they were able to piece that thing together and bring him to justice. Same what you saw happen yesterday in Yemen. Pretty difficult place to operate. Uh, there is a lot of turmoil there. Uh, I have been there. I, if it's on your vacation list, I might wanna, you might want to take that off. <laughs> Your vacation list, pretty rough neighborhood in a, in a, pretty, in a broader rough neighborhood, if you will. It is, and we're facing tremendous challenges, both economically and now uh, with uh, what is a fight uh, in and of itself. It's the first place where Al-Qaeda has decided that they want to hold ground. So there is parts of southern Yemen where Al-Qaeda actually is holding ground. So even though we've had some great success, and I think we have really disrupt operations targeted at the United States. There is still a group, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, Northern Africa area, who wakes up every single day, uh, and they have the mission and the dedication and the commitment to try to put a plan together to kill U.S. citizens or our uh, Western allies. And they preferred, and that's why al was so important for us, he was uh, an American citizen who grew up in America, who understood America, who was making it his effort to recruit Americans to commit acts of terror here in the United States. And with the Christmas Day bomber, almost was successful. With Major Hassan, the shooting in Texas was successful. Uh, the cartridge bombs that they were building to try to get them into the United States, to blow up planes over the continental United States, uh, but not for our intelligence professionals, would have been successful. He was developing, and he had a group of individuals, their whole uh, day is spent trying to develop ways to circumvent our U.S. security systems in order to commit an act of terror. So yes, it's important. Yes, we got somebody who was influential in al-Qaeda uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, but this fight's not over. And that brings me, I think, to part of my message today. You know, we're we are a little bit of a different place, America, and we have a, a bit of a different foundation. I mean, our principles are all based on an idea. Very few countries have that. They were founded just on the notion and idea that our liberties and our freedoms are naturally born. They're inalienable. Our liberty and our justice and our equality and our opportunity is self-born. It's our own responsibility to get out in the world and make it so. That we don't have to wait for the government to give us any of those things. And that has, in a uniquely way, in the rest of the world made us the world's greatest economy. And it's not something we should be bashful about. It has worked well for the United States, and it has allowed us to provide leadership across the world that has brought prosperity at home and safety and security abroad and promoted the ideas of liberty and freedom. It's an important thing. So when some people talk to me about that $80 billion and isn't it too much and maybe the weight of all of our defense is getting too much for the United States, I say step back a minute and try to imagine the world in any other way other than the United States of America playing a leading role in promoting our ideals overseas, engaging in commerce, which is, by the way, the best diplomat we have, and trying to make sure that the world doesn't collapse in and around itself into chaos, as we have seen it do certainly in the last century, twice, more than twice two world wars. Pretty big deal. So if you look at where we are and all of the challenges that face us today. So we've had success in Al-Qaeda, but what's next? China is its role and its rise in the world, and it's certainly becoming more nationalistic. The AQ terrorist groups have not gone away. And I will tell you, you'll hear pundits, and I've heard this a lot, say that the splinter groups are going to fight amongst themselves. Remember who these splinter groups are. These are organizations that came to Al-Qaeda to offer their services because they believed in their message and their tactics, Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. So they've joined the core of Al-Qaeda and brought money and resources and finance with them. So some notion that they're splinter groups, I think, is dangerous if we're going to continue to protect ourselves from what they hope is a successful event here in the United States. If you look at Iran and North Korea and their pursuit of nuclear weapons, you look at Russia's interesting push 
toward getting back on the international stage. Uh, I, I have often been in trouble, as you said, speak my mind. I call it the great kleptocracy of Russia uh, in the sense that if you look at the way they operate, it is a very self-serving government that uh, in, enriches itself before it enriches its people. Uh, and it has a very keen interest in rejoining the world stage. Uh, they're up to some interesting things. Maybe we can talk about that a little bit in questions. I want to talk about China for a minute. Since 1989, uh, they have grown their defense budget by 18, excuse me, 13 percent per year. Now, most of their budget is secret. We believe that in just the last few years, they've spent uh, hundreds of billions of dollars uh, in their buildup of both conventional uncon and unconventional uh, in land, space, sea, and most, uh, most aggressively in cyberspace. Uh, and their investment continues to grow. So for a nation that condemns the United States and spending money on national defense, they are quick to spend their own money on a very growing and robust military presence around the world. They have the second largest economy. In 2011, they surpassed the United States as the top manufacturing in the world. Uh, it holds one quarter of our debt. It, and uh, many, and me uh, included, believe that they engage quite regularly in predatory economic behavior, manipulating their currency, illegally subsidizing their businesses. Intellectual property theft is rife and alive and well, unfortunately, in China. And we are the primary victims of that intellectual property theft. Talk about Iran for a second. It's less uh, clear. I mean, one thing we do know about China is they do have nuclear weapons, and they are pointed at the United States. What we don't know about Iran is where their nuclear program is exactly. I believe in the report, I think that it was uh, Hugh mentioned earlier, uh, I, in 2006, after a thorough review of all classified information, uh, came to the conclusion that they were well on their way to reengaging their nuclear program, and they were in a hurry to do it. And unfortunately, at the time, it was a bit controversial. We've been proven right. Uh, that intelligence was accurate. They clearly are engaged in, uh, in reestablishing and aggressively reestablishing uh, the strength of their nuclear program. Now, they have not been able to get to that last phase of, I believe, of, of weaponizing a nuclear weapon, but all of the elements are coming together for them. They're in a big hurry to do it, uh, and that is a dangerous place in the world. Today, it is the most, and I'm talking about Iran, the most aggressive nation-state sponsor of terrorism in the world. Look at their actions through Hezbollah, uh, in, in Lebanon. That is uh, turned into a proxy organization uh, for Iran uh, that is actively engaged in terrorist acts. Uh, the Syrian government is a proxy for Iran and, and is fairly aggressive uh, at engaging in pretty bad acts, including, by the way, during the uh, er height of the Iraq conflict, uh, using that as a conduit to get munitions that were targeting U.S. soldiers. Uh, their efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan to get new and sophisticated weapon systems to the enemy of the United States and NATO forces is alive and well. Their latest round is something called an IRAM. I won't go through the whole nomenclature of it, but it is a more deadly and more accurate rocket system that they have provided. Um, these are pretty strong words, but they have provided to the enemies of the United States, and we know that those rockets are targeted against U.S. forces. You can't get more aggressive than that. Uh, can you imagine a, a nuclear Iran? One of the things that I believe, and studying this issue for years, is that it will pro proliferate nuclear weapons across the Middle East. Countries have already said in the Middle East, countries you might imagine, Turkey and Saudi Arabia and others, who have said, if Iran goes nuclear, we're going nuclear too. Can you imagine the destabilizing factor of a, the largest nation state in support of terrorism who, is now have, who now has nuclear weapon capability and what that means for other nations who believe they have to protect themselves. Pretty scary world. You know, America's security and prosperity is going to require world leadership. Our unique power comes with unique responsibilities. I can't imagine a world influenced by China or Russia uh, because the United States decided that we would recede in its role for moral leadership. There are many uh, in the United States ready to cede that role of international leadership. They believe that we should manage our decline. 
and focus only inward. And that somehow that will save our prosperity, it will save our liberty, and save the next generation of Americans. But you know, history is a great teacher in these circumstances. If you look at what we did to Great Britain when it came to economic prowess and stealing their ideas and the textile industries and other things, how our industrial revolution, a, a lot of it came from our brethren in Great Britain. We borrowed a lot of their ideas and we implemented them under a system that was more free and more innovative. And it allowed people to keep their successes when they were willing to risk it all. And in about a very short period, almost 20 years, we went from being uh, uh, the boot under their throat to surpassing them economically as the engine of the world for innovation and economy. And got into about the 1900s, they decided that they were willing to cede back because the British people had been tired of their efforts around the world. Now, their efforts would have been completely different to us. We're certainly looking uh, at no empire building. We look to hold no territory. We look to not subjugate any uh, individuals around the world to the United States. But instead, we wanted new markets, and we wanted to have people have their standard of, of uh, living rise so that we could sell them something, right? The great model of, of uh, commercial engagement. And it worked, and it worked tremendously well. But the problem was when they ceded it to us in the 1900s, we weren't ready for it. We weren't ready to engage all of the difficulties in Europe. And for 40 years, there was a power struggle when Great Britain decided to step back. And they lost a lot in the world. Their economic engine declined rapidly. Their power and influence to stop trouble right across the, the channel was diminished. And because of that turmoil and because we weren't ready to engage, 40 years of trouble, two world wars, really a difficult time. And look at London and in, in Great Britain today. They are having a difficult time trying to even figure out how they get out of their economic malaise. And they don't have the instruments or the levers or really the power to get through it. They're going to have to count on everyone else to help save them, including the United States. We've seen this movie before, and it does not turn out well for the nation who recedes from international engagement, who says that their defense and our intelligence capabilities are not worth the investment so that our prosperity may follow. This is an important time in our history, a very important time in our history. And the world is watching. So when I hear people say that they're really ready and willing to say the rise of China is the decline of the United States, I hold my breath and hope that many don't start marching to that tune. And when some say it's time to manage our decline in a way where we engage in the mediocrity of world of politics, I hope many don't engage in that debate. I happened to be in Beirut, Beirut excuse me, Lebanon, earlier this week. Pretty tough time still, even after the war in 06. And I met with some very senior uh, military leaders in the Lebanese army who are doing all they can to try to get hold and get security back in all sectors of Lebanon and hopefully try to get out of this economy that they're in. It's pretty tough. And that is a tough neighborhood as well. And when we were all done, I think we made some progress. And I was leaving one of the meetings. One of the senior officers grabbed me. Uh, and his English was pretty good. And he said, Congressman, please, 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 don't let the United States do this. We need you to do this. You're the only nation that gives us hope to keep trying to fight in a dangerous neighborhood. The world is watching. Eastern Europeans saw that when we didn't give up and we kept trying, and it didn't mean military conflict, it meant that we were engaged, that we lowered the wall for freedom for millions of citizens who were trapped under the communist rule. There are folks in every country in the world who, when I travel overseas, who will still take a minute and say how impressed and how they stand in awe of the United States and the peoples of the United States. They may not like every one of our policies, but they understand the collective mindset that the United States isn't about the power of Washington, D.C. It is about the power of individuals who are taking great risks in our economy and trying to better themselves and the future of this country. And they get it. And they see it. 
and the fear of those that their lives would be t turned over to the other big boys on the block, as I've heard him say, China or Russia, and what their interests would be in helping a small country like Lebanon terrifies them because they know that there is no other nation on the face of the earth who has been a force for good like the United States of America. We didn't take anything, but we have certainly given a lot. And at the same time, we have gotten a lot in return. The most prosperous nation on the face of the earth is the United States of America. And it is because we engage. It's because we apply our intelligence services to do good things. It's because we invest in our military on the idea that we may have to use it. And it's because once we used to say things, it meant something. If we said we're coming, we're coming. And if we said we're staying until it's done, it meant we're staying till it's done. That was one of the strengths in our engagement policy overseas. I hope we return to it. So I hope that you'll take a minute and as the debate folds here as we move forward to, to stand up and reflect a little bit about what our strong national defense posture has meant and what our engagement overseas. Isolationism has never helped America. Never, not once in our history. This is no time to reel in. Just because it's hard and Americans have grown weary of this as well, it means that we have to stand up and make our case about how important it is for the future of the world, for the future prosperity of our great country, and the future generations of Americans, that they'll inherit a place that is both prosperous and free and a world leader for a better place. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today. I uh, want to thank uh, all of you for your interest. I'm going to do one quick thing before I uh, turn it over. I see I have about two more minutes here. One of the great things that stand in our way, one of the hurdles, A, it's our political will collectively as Americans. Do we want to continue what has been a very difficult task, and that's world leadership? The second, uh, and, and a lot of this is based on our own economy and the troubles that we have, and they are real, and they are tough, and we're going to have to make some tough decisions. But I want to give you just a couple of things on the debt. Uh, there's no greater threat to our national security and our economic prosperity than our debt. If we don't get a handle on it, uh, think of this. Uh, at current rates, uh, our debt will be three times the size of our economy. By the end of this decade, just the percentage we pay on interest of our national expenditures will be 20 percent. 20 percent. 20 cents of every dollar will go to interest payments. The, I'll tell you one thing that is a mathematical certainty. That is a recipe for disaster for the United States. It's exactly what happened with Great Britain. It's exactly what happened with every other great power in the world. They spent too much. Uh, they stopped paying attention. And the weight of that crushed their ability to do anything good in the world. I will tell you the... Uh, the Sometimes the debate in Washington, D.C. seems a little ugly. And a little small. And I hope that collectively as a nation we can step back and try to get through the, those what sometimes certainly seem like party, uh, petty differences. Some are substantial differences. And some are different philosophies of where this country ought to go. And get back to the collective debate in America about where we do want to go. And if we can finally agree on that, that we ought to stay engaged, that we have to deal pretty toughly and make some very hard and difficult decisions on our debt and our deficit, not just because it's the thing to do for the next election, but because it's the thing to do for the next generation of Americans, I think this country is going to be fine. But we're going to have to have that debate. I hope we can elevate it so that we have that debate in a way that we can all be appreciative and respectful of people with differences of opinion who want to get to a better place. But if we don't do that, we're going to clearly fall behind. As I said, you know, the interesting thing happened last November. That should have been the warning shot that the race is on. The Russians and the Chinese negotiated that in a bilateral agreement they would not use the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency in any bilateral exchanges that they do. They didn't do it because it was the best financial policy that they might engage in. 
They did it to fire a round over the bow of the United States that said, we are ready and willing to challenge your international prowess, not only from the military and your intelligence services, but economically as well. They're ready for that fight. We need to make sure we're ready for that fight. I'll tell you one last story here. I had a great occasion to be with a Russian general. We we're working on national defense issues, missile defense, before the program changed substantially. And he was uh, probably the largest Russian soldier I think I've ever seen in my life. Not that I've seen a lot of them, but this guy was huge. He was probably 6'8", 320 pounds, but he was very lean. His hat didn't even look right on his head. It looked a little tiny as for me. I wasn't going to say anything. So after our negotiations, we were also trying to push for a, uh, a port of call in Vladivostok uh, for our U.S. Navy to try to start thawing relations if we could. None of that went very well. But as we were done with this meeting, he said, Congressman, can I talk to you for a minute? And he puts his hand on my shoulder, and his hand was huge, about the size of your plate. And he says, step in this room. And I thought, you know, I've seen this movie, and this does not end well for me. <laughs> he said, I just want to tell you that it's great to hear that America is finally declaring that she's a nation in decline. And since we've been through it, we stand prepared to give you all the advice and counsel that you can take. They know the world is changing, but what they don't know is the American resolve. I have faith and confidence that the United States is not going to take second fiddle to anybody, that we should never, never, never apologize for the system that has worked to empower so many millions of people to rise up to the middle class, the largest middle class in the history of the world. That's the debate we should have. That's the path we ought to be on. I hope you'll engage in it, and you'll participate in the world's greatest democracy when the election allows. Thank you very, very much for having me today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we're listening to a Friday forum featuring the Honorable Mike Rogers, U.S. Representative for Michigan's 8th Congressional District and Chair of the House Intelligence Committee. We will return to our speaker in a moment for our traditional City Club questions, and we encourage you to formulate your questions now. Please remember to keep them brief. We remind you that members and guests alike are welcome to attend City Club forums, and we hope everybody listening will join the City Club. If you're not already a member, please do join. And visit our website to see a full schedule of our upcoming programs. We welcome all of you here today and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partners are WVIZ PBS IdeaStream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC. Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. In 2012, the City Club of Cleveland will turn 100 years old. We're planning a number of great events and will be actively soliciting support throughout the year in our campaign for a new century. Our celebration will begin on October 10th, next Monday, in a national conference on free speech at the Allen Theater. We'd love to see you there. For more information about our upcoming forums, please refer to our website, www.cityclub.org. And to learn more about the 100th anniversary events, visit the 100th anniversary tab on our website. If you wish to make reservations for upcoming programs or order a CD or DVD of today's program, please call 1-888-223-6786 or 216-621-0082. On Wednesday, October 5, the City Club will host Rami Khoury, director of the Issam Faris Institute of Public Policy. This event is free and will be held at the Breen Center at St. Ignatius. Friday, October 7th, the City Club welcomes civil rights attorney Fred Gray, Sr., this program is in partnership with the Frank Battisti Memorial Lecture at the Case Western Reserve School of Law. Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club questions and answers. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. And holding the microphone today is City Club Program Director, Carrie Miller. First question, please. Thank you for being here, uh, Congressman, and uh, thank you for your service. Thank you. Um, Recent news out of Pakistan suggests that the Pakistanis and the ISI are again not acting as the allies that we would hope they would be. 
What suggestions, if any, do you have uh, to getting better cooperation out of Pakistan? Yeah, I have spent a lot of time in Pakistan uh, on both sides of that, the Duran line. Uh, I, it's the most frustrating relationship I think the United States has with another nation right now. And I have found that Pakistan is an army that has a country. Uh, their civil form of government does not function well, and it doesn't function without the authority of the army and their intelligence services, the ISI. And as I have told General Kiani himself, until Pakistan uh, understands that there is no such thing as a good terrorist, we are going to have some very uh, rough days ahead in our relationship. And what I mean by that is the ISI's uh, questionable relationship with certain elements in the tribal areas that we know are engaging U.S. troops across the border and we know are, have been at least facilitating to some degree uh, activities of uh, Al-Qaeda. And I don't think it goes straight to the top. I have said this before. We don't have any evidence that says the top leadership allows this to happen, but we do believe there are lots of elements within the intelligence service, the ISI, that are complicit and certainly have sympathies. So I think you have to engage. It's a weapon that has, uh, excuse me, a country that has nuclear weapons. Uh, it will probably be the fastest growing nuclear weapon state, at least in the next decade. Uh, meaning that they're going to try to add to their arsenal. Uh, and it, I never find that walking away makes for a better uh, circumstance there. So for those that say, cut them off, let's leave, let's do it, I, I understand the sentiment, and nobody could be more frustrated than me, but it will not, the situation will not get better if we're not engaged there trying to make this thing work. And so I think there's some, some more hur uh, hurdles we can, not hurdles, but at least criteria we can put on funding uh, for things that have to happen in order for us to continue certain aspects of our funding to Pakistan. Uh, and we have to have a stronger engagement. We have to get over this trust factor. We have a huge trust factor. I flew there right after uh, the Osama bin Laden raid because we had some pretty good information that Pakistan may be interested in doing some bad things to some good people. And we've had some, I think, as I don't have to travel as a diplomat, I can say what I need to say, which I thought is helpful. Uh, and I didn't get thrown out. That's good news. Uh, but we had some strong conversations. Now, I don't think that moved them really very much at all, other than to put them on notice that, that members of Congress, as well as the administration, and we, we are responsible for the funding mechanisms there, are paying attention. We have seen a whole series of very frustrating things happen since, making it more difficult for our diplomats to work in Pakistan. Uh, some questions about cross-border operations that I think you saw in the media recently. So we're, we're going to continue to engage. I do think uh, a more aggressive posture along the border is probably going to be in order, and I, I don't want anyone to walk out thinking that Congressman Rogers just talked about troop movements into Pakistan. That's not what we're talking about at all. But when we see bad things getting ready to happen, I think we're going to have to take uh, the opportunity to make sure that our troops are safe and come home. So uh, I hope that answers it. I, I, again, I, if anyone tells you they know the answer to Pakistan, I, 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 don't, I don't think they're being honest with themselves. It is, I have seen a relationship start out in the morning fantastic, and by noon it has gone completely south in Pakistan. It is the most frustrating place we can deal with. Thank you for the question. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for being here. Yeah. Uh, there are many reports of untold billions of dollars being spent on projects in Afghanistan that we are funding that have never been completed, many of them never started that money is being shipped out of the country. Where is the control for this? Who's watching it? Who has the ability to control it and stop it? Yeah. We're not sure what the total value is. We do believe that there has been some corruption, some skimming of the money. I, I'm a former FBI agent, so it's never just about the money. It's always about the money. Uh, go there first. So we do think that that has been a problem. We have a very good IG, uh, Inspector General group, that's in country now, and some of that was disclosed through their work. Uh, so we know that that process is working. Uh, and 
you know, listen, I have never been one for the big projects anyway. I think smaller projects, well-focused, well-monitored, have much more bigger benefit for the United States. That being said, we are starting to slow down the flow of money, uh, and we're trying to make sure uh, that the money that arrives there is spent on things that will have long-term benefit for the area. And it's, you know, it's Afghanist, Afghan culture is is – it's rife with corruption, but some of that is an absolute way of life. And so you, it's, it is a frustrating place to go through and, and lay on our conditions on an environment that doesn't understand those conditions remotely, especially in the, some of the rem, more remote tribal areas uh, in Pakistan or the tribal chief, chieftains, the Maliks and those kinds of things. So it is a process that we're trying to get better at. I can't tell you that they're good at it. Where we find those problems, we have said that we're going to be very aggressive about prosecution uh, and, and as I said, slowing that money down. Uh, Congress, Congressman Rogers, at the end of your talk today, you spoke about the bickering in Washington. Uh, about a year ago, uh, the Republican head of the, of the United States Senate said that the main uh, function uh, of the remaining time is going to be to see to it that uh, President Obama is defeated. Mm. And certainly the bickering that has occurred on all kinds of matters, some very trivial, reflect that kind of philosophy. As a leading Republican in the House of Representatives, what is your feeling about that philosophy and when you think the time will come that the Republican Party will realize that in addition to defeating Obama, which is a certainly important part of, the, of their philosophy, it's very important that we give attention to the problems that we have in America today. Sure. Well, I never believe the, the function of a party is to beat an elected leader. I do believe functions of parties are to get their party officials elected in elections. Uh, I have al always believed that uh, there are elections and there are governance, and it's wise to know the difference. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I, here's the problem, is, is that unfortunately this thing has gone into what looks like a death spiral of petty partisanship. Uh, it's very frustrating to a guy who's been – matter of fact, I'll give you a great example on my committee. I work very well with my Democrat counterpart. I think in matters of national security, especially in the intelligence business, where so few of us get the access and responsibility of the information and what to do with it, that we should be working together at all costs. There had not been an intelligence authorization bill for six years before I took the role as chairman. Six years. I try to run a business without applying your, your margin to a, to a budget that doesn't exist. You're going to get in trouble, right? So we sat down and said, we're, we're going to do away with that. Uh, and we did. And we've gotten not only one, but two passed already. Uh, and it's because we have decided we weren't going to engage ourselves in that. And I hope that prevails across Congress. What you see happening, though, and I think this is an important distinction, lots of frustration, as you are frustrated. But there are some very big philosophical differences that are kind of colliding. Uh, and some of that, I think, is manifested into some of these smaller debates that you see that you kind of look and turn on the TV and go, huh, you're fighting about what? Uh, doesn't really make sense to me. But I think that's what you're seeing. And they are true big philosophical debates. Part of that I talked about. If we know where we're going as a country, I think it's easier for us to come together on the solution. And I would submit to you that there are fundamental differences about where we're going as a country, and you're seeing that, as I said, manifested uh, across a whole wide spectrum. So I'm hoping that at some point here, when the numbers and the math finally sink in, that this is real. This is a real turning point for our country. If we don't come together on a solution on this, we are all in trouble, all of us. And we're doing something to our children that I never thought would be conscionable to any of us. That our generation would turn around and hand a broken America to the next generations of Americans. We didn't find it broken. It had some issues, but it wasn't broken. And so I hope that we can, as I said, I think some of it's getting ugly and some of it gets small and some of it gets petty. And I will say this about our president. I have to tell you, and I'm, I've worked with this president. I worked with him on Libya. I think I was one of eight Republicans that stood up and said, oh, Mr. President, I'm with you on this. I work with his national security advisor frequently. So this isn't a, I don't want you to take this as a partisan statement. I have been a little bit surprised that the president would use the functions of office in what I think is a pretty small way. And I think when that happens, 
it fuels the fire of all of these other petty things. Um, on the health care thing, he came recently on his, his, his jobs plan before he went out and, and went to a whole series of fun. That, I just have never seen that before. And so there is plenty of culpability in this, but I hope as Americans we kind of stir ourselves out of this. And if we all don't engage in the pettiness of the debate, I think that will rise up through the ranks of folks who are supposed to make smart decisions. It doesn't mean we're not going to agree all the time. We won't. But it does mean at the end of the day, we have got to find a common solution so we can move forward. And it means you might not get everything you want. I know that's hard to say, but what is that old book? I learned everything I needed in the third grade. I think Congress could use a good dose of that, I'll tell you that. Thank you for your remarks. Thank um, you. My concerns are about domestic intelligence uh, authorization <clears throat> excuse me, within the United States. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to know, in light of the recent New York Times article about uh, David Cohen and the former CIA uh, official being kind of embedded in the New York Police Department um, and CIA operatives apparently down in FBI uh, divisions, the 56 divisions and fusion centers, what is the authority for uh, the CIA to conduct uh, domestic uh, intelligence operations? You know, what authorities are there? What was the executive order? What was the mm -hmm. nature of it? And can you talk a little bit about uh, the role and scope of domestic intelligence? Sure. One of the things that uh, happened right after 9-11, if you recall, one of the big gripes was that there was not sharing. You know, with, nobody shared information. Well, if, if I received information through a grand jury as an FBI agent, and this, this happened even when we were in, and it said bad guy X is bringing something really bad uh, through, I don't know, Miami, but we're just not sure of the exact nature of his relationship with any nation state. I was by law prohibited from sharing that information with the CIA or other agencies because of the nature of which I obtained it. And so we had this very clear, stark line. So a lot of it was blamed on culture. Remember that time? That, if you remember that debate at the time, it was the FBI hates the CIA and they don't want to talk to each other. I got to tell you, I look horrible in one of those orange jumpsuits with the numbers on the back. That's a, pr that's a pretty good driver for me not to do something the law told me not to do. So what we decided to do after that is through a whole series of things, the way we re reorganize the intelligence service says we're going to find legal ways, constitutionally, uh, allowable to share information because we think when you're sharing information you're better off. So what you see is that the CIA has the ability to be in the United States. They cannot target United States citizens. To this day they cannot target United States citizens. If they find, and it was under review and I agreed with the review uh, uh, in New York, that that person participated in targeting United States citizens, they're going to have a problem and I argue they should have a problem. If they're there in the course of sharing information that in the course of an interview, me, Mike Rogers, FBI agent, uh, talking to you know Bob the tire salesman, got a piece of information about some guy overseas, it would be legitimate to walk over to his desk and say, here is this citizen overseas, can you see what you can find out through your agency? That is very permissible, it's also very legal. There is no violation of any uh, uh, Fourth Amendment due process clause at all. And so I think that's been watched pretty well. I think, you know, I, I never like to go into an investigation or, or an IG review with an answer. I do believe that that's the relationship of which they had in that particular agency. Um, and there's been a lot of, and I think there's, I have to say, I, I helped work on something called the Patriot Act. I know that got just horrible tr trashing around that was going to, somehow we had to cede our rights as Americans in order to be safer, and I wholeheartedly reject that. We don't have to cede our rights to be safer. What that bill basically did is line up the same kind of techniques I could use uh, as an FBI agent working organized crime in the United States with an FBI agent working terrorism issues, including uh, uh, foreign citizens. There is nothing in that that would allow the government to do anything they can't do with a U.S. citizen without going to a third-party arbitration. They have to go to a judge. You got to get a warrant. You got to get a subpoena. That's all protected in those things. So I think there's a lot of confusion. I think there's a lot of misnomers about what those things did. Uh, and again, we're going to review that because the allegation was made. I think that's the appropriate thing. I, I'm not concerned if it, if it involves information sharing. I am concerned if the CIA uh, wants to uh, 
engage in activities against U.S. citizens. That is clearly prohibited. We should protect that division. It's the right thing to do. Um, but we ought to, you know, remember, there's lots of foreign citizens in the United States that they can, uh, you know, look at. And so given that arrangement, I think it's probably a healthy one, but something we should watch. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'd like to take and focus a little bit closer. Uh, Ohio seems a long way from Texas and Arizona. What is going on down there, and particularly since Town Hall had that big expose about the United States selling uh, arms to the drug cartels? Yeah, that that was a a horrible tragedy. What he's talking about, um, I forget the name of the operation now. There was a, a full operation by the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Uh, to sell weapons and then try to track the weapons into Mexico to see what bad things might have happened. They lost control of the weapons at some point. And they believed that uh, one of those weapons may have been involved uh, in the killing uh, of a law enforcement personnel. H horrible idea. I don't know. I, I, this, this was a bad idea from the start. Um, sh shouldn't, have, shouldn't have happened, shouldn't have got as far as it did. That being said, let me, let me back up on, on Mexico. I, there are days, I, you know, there's a lot of days in this job I don't get to sleep at night. So I really wanted to come in here and scare the bejesus out of you so you can't sleep at night either. I figure I should be in good company. Um, one of the things that worries me a lot is a failed nation state on our southern border. The cartels have gained so much strength, and, and we are, in this case, a victim of our own success. We were very good about helping the Colombians go after their drug problem. And if you recall, it wasn't all that long ago, if you were a prosecutor or a judge, you had about a 25-minute life expectancy. They were targeting their, the judicial system in a way that was, the state was starting to collapse. And so the United States, along with their partners in Colombia, really went after the FARC, which became, it was an ideological organization trying to take over uh, Colombia, became a narco-trafficking organization involved in armed conflict because they were fueled with drug money. They used to use these Mexican cartels as transit, right? So they were, they were basically the taxi service for the drug trade. Well, because of the efforts in Colombia, the Colombian, or excuse me, the Mexican drug cartels became so powerful and so rich that they now uh, are almost in the same place that the Colombians were as far as influence and power and absolute brutality. Uh, I don't know if you saw recently, they found 350 bodies tortured and killed and just laid in the, laid in the highway. Uh, they have assassinated police chiefs. Uh, within 24 hours of taking the assignment. They are engaged right up to the border, and our fear is it won't be long before it spills over the border. So it is something that we're working on. We're working on, I've, I've been down to Mexico City, um, trying to engage the Mexican authorities about what's, what's next and what the appropriate role is for the United States to help them with this problem, including engaging you know, countries like Colombia who have gone through it and see if they can't, you know, be helpful in some way, or Ecuador, or Panama, or some of the, the some of those countries that have fought back on these kinds of issues. It is a I cannot tell you how serious this problem is, and if the the, the state of Mexico doesn't fail, uh, certainly provinces along the border may fail. That's how bad this violence is. So that again, it's something that we're watching. It is not something that gets a lot of attention. I hope it gets more attention as we move forward. We're going to have to have some real hard conversations with ourselves about what happens next uh, to those drug cartels. Congressman Rogers, you yes, indicated before that Pakistan was uh, the Army and the Intelligence Service were looking for a country uh, rather than the other way around. Yeah. Well, they have a country. They don't have to look too hard. <laughs> yeah, but it, but you see, it seems to say that the the interest of Pakistan, the Intelligence Service, and the Army aren't always in sync the government. What are the intentions of those parties with in Pakistan, with in Pakistan uh, as it relates to Afghanistan and all that? Uh, there are lots of broader political implications across that whole spectrum. Pakistan's number one threat in their minds, I want to make sure this clear, is India. They are absolutely concerned that India uh, is coming across the border. We have talked to them, we meet with our Indian allies, we talk to the Pakistanis, we say we will do everything we can to mitigate anything that might look like that to happen. Uh, 
it's, it is very deeply held by the military that this is their biggest threat. Over the course of time, Afghanistan has not been, I can't tell you the unseemly conversations I've had by very senior Pakistani leaders about how they feel about the leadership of Afghanistan. I mean, it is as passionate as you can possibly imagine, and they are distrustful. They think that the Indians are working with the Afghans to cause them trouble. So you have to go into that conversation understanding the dynamics of that political belief system. They then uh, believed, I think, that having some friends in the tribal areas who are bad people but are interested in doing bad things to Afghanistan might be in their national interests. Uh, we're going to have to work awful hard to convince them that is not the case. And if you recall, some of that got turned internally to that you can't control these groups once they're empowered to do bad things. And so our effort has been we need to convince the Pakistanis that their dealings with these folks at whatever level needs to stop, uh, and they need to increase their uh, cooperation with the United States. And let me tell you why this is frustrating. Because after I just said all that, you're thinking, why are we there? They sent troops at our behest in 2004 into the tribal areas. They had never had troops in the tribal areas. They took thousands of casualties trying to disrupt uh, especially in North and South Waziristan, um, militant movements and tribal movements, and it's very tribal there, uh, to see if they couldn't disrupt those activities. They just recently did a raid on a very significant uh, Al-Qaeda figure, a guy named uh, Mauritania, uh, their own operation, conducted it on their own intelligence, and arrested him and have shared access to him with the United States. So all the frustrating things I just told you, at the same time they're doing this. That's why it is the hardest relationship uh, to get through. Just when you think you're ready to give up, they do something really nice. So maybe they're smarter than we are. I don't know. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been listening to Mike Rogers, Chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, Thank you, Congressman Rogers. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned. That was, that was really good. Oh, hey.